We are now entering chapter 17, the title of which is Message on the Wind. Brian and Kevin had snatched something to eat and got out of the house well before the noise of cars had awakened their parents. Brian told Kevin the story of the buses, the little dog up the road, and Kevin sat looking out across the lowland from the sill of the barn where they sat, tears coming quietly down his cheeks. What's wrong, Kevin? What do you suppose is wrong? I'm worried about the girls. Brian waited a moment, then he asked, Is there anything special? Do you think you might know where they are? Of course not, stupid. We looked everywhere, didn't we? Again, Brian was thoughtful. No, not everywhere. Well, since you're so smart, where didn't we look? We didn't look at the toy village, but Mom did. Grown-ups don't see things we see. They're farther away. <laughs> they couldn't be hiding there. If they'd fallen in the pool, we'd see them. He turned his head away in grief and anger. I suppose, but that's where we could start. I've got a feeling. You and your feelings. Nuts. Where else haven't we looked? We haven't looked down where I saw Bumworthy and that other guy. And we haven't looked where you and Bart zapped those guys in the jeep. We couldn't be there. Where? Where the jeep was, stupid. We'd have seen them. They might have gone there after you left. More likely down by the bulldozers. Those girls were always messing around where girls shouldn't go. Mum says that where boys can go, girls can go. Kevin shrugged his brother. You're so smart. Whose side are you on, mine or theirs? I just want to find them. So do you. Okay, smarty pants, let's go. Brian ran after him. Kev, yeah, we start with the toy village, okay? Okay, for the good that'll do. Then you can go to the jeep place, and I'll go to the bulldozers. Okay. The toy village was as Kevin had left it. No alien smell remained, but Kevin recalled his clean-up and the questions being full of them. Brian? Yeah. Remember the night before last? No. Kevin looked at him. Brian was not fooling. He was looking carefully around the toy houses and at the edges of the pool. Brian! We're out in the fog together. Kevin was feeling desperate. He knew he had shared the experience. Brian must be pretending. Kev, Kev, they were here. I found a peanut. Mum said she gave them peanuts. So what? We knew they were here. The thing is, where did they go from here? And here's a footprint in the mud. Kevin went over to the bottle brother and shook him. You didn't answer my question. What question? You and I were out in the fog and the rain together the night before last, and there was uh, ice and thunder. I was not with you. And there was no rain or fog that night. You're crazy. You're covering up something. He shook himself free from Kevin as tears began to come down his face. He rushed over to the edge of the village clearing, snatching a stone as he did. You've done something to them. You always hated them. Brian rushed off, throwing his own stone furiously. It nearly hit Kevin, who stood astonished, his anger drained away, abashed and ashamed. Brian was wrong. He had done nothing to the girls themselves. But Brian was also right. He had wished to often enough. Kevin turned away from the village towards the neighboring field. And as he had accused Brian of being with him, and spoke out his few words up that, that night, there had been an unreality to it. It had begun to seem like a dream, but now it seemed more real than ever, and the trees and the grasses that surrounded him seemed unreal, transparent. He stopped. What was it? Something familiar, something that was a clue to the terrible night in the glacier. It was the smell, vile and putrid, the smell... It had been on his own body. He could sense it distinctly. It was coming across the field from the direction of the clump of trees where he and Bart had harassed the man in the jeep. Debbie noticed the smell more, too. She danced with Linda along the base of the mountain. It was a strong, burning smell and reminded her of a story Daddy had told her. He'd been putting her to bed one night when she had a cold, and, he, and she hadn't liked the smell of the Vicks ointment he'd rubbed on her chest. Daddy, tell me a story about when you were a little boy. 
with a story about when I was a little boy at sea do just as well. Okay, Daddy. Well, during the war, we had to go way down to the West Indies and search the islands for submarines. The submarines were sinking ships and killing people. One day we came to a lovely island, the second or third in a string of lovely islands that rise with high peaks up of the sea. The ship's commander said to me, Skase, you see that hill over there with all the forts and guns on it? Yes, sir, I said. That's Brimstone Hill, a great fort in the past. Why is it called Brimstone, sir? I said. The way you see, Skase, you'll know as we pass close to it. Then you know what happened? What happened, Dada? I, we went a little farther, and there was this tremendous bad smell from the water and bubbles coming up. He said to me, that's why it's called Brimstone Hill. All that sulfur coming up. It's an old volcano. They say it could blow at any time. Debbie didn't remember any more, because she got off to sleep, but it came back to her now. The great hill, the great smell, and the threat. It could blow up any time. She called to Linda, Come, Lindy, we must get behind the mountain. It could blow at any time. Brian, too, noticed a smell. But it was his mate's fa faint smell of gunpowder. He knew this only from toy pistol caps and wondered who could have been firing cap pistols since he last went along this road allowance. It was, anyway, only the last of several smells that he noticed as he walked. It was nice to smell, notice the smells without seeing, and he enjoyed them, sweet grasses, whiffs of manure from Letcherley's barn, wide roses, and the after smell when the lilac turned to seed. He was more interested in the earthy smells, especially rotten wood, and paused just for a moment to look at his log of yesterday. But he had more serious things to attend to. He had been shaken by the quarrel with his brother. Though no sense of guilt attached to it, he had not picked the quarrel. Kevin had flared up because of his own mixed-up character. And he was still convinced Kevin knew something would help find the girls. Whatever it was, if the girls were not dead or unconscious or kidnapped, it must be extraordinary, because hunger alone would have brought one of them limping home or crying or something. But Kevin was being strange. Brian had often noticed that as Kevin behaved, so behaved the family. If Kevin's mood was difficult, Mum was difficult. Dad was silent, and the girls would tease worse than ever. Now Kevin's mood was strange, nuts. There was something there Brian could not focus on at all. He soon reached the culvert and retraced his steps the rest of the day. There was little reason to do so from the point of view of the enemy, because the triple O people would not be working today, but Brian was looking for a clue. He found none till he reached the tree where he had hidden uh, like a prince among the rebels. Then he saw something, some wrapping paper on the ground. They said, danger, explosives. And on what would have been the other side when the explosives were inside? Dynamite! At the same time, he smelled the gunpowder more fiercely as a little wind came up from the west. Many feet below, the waters pressed at the root of the great boulder like pop in a shaken bottle or champagne ready to shoot the cork. The fuse was burning extraordinarily slowly but it was within inches of the detonators that would explode the dynamite. Perhaps the ground was damp there, for unlike a good dry fuse, it smoked, and a little scarcely visible trail of smoke wound up through the trees into the branches of the big pine. Because of the minister's arrival, the procession had been diverted from the Walkworth fairgrounds, and the meager food supplies that were waiting down in the call pasture were rushed over to satisfy the starving crowd. Cynthia still had the situation well in hand and had diverted the children over into the fields where the stalls were in fair time. She had the OFY gang, Ontario for you, gang, running games and doing tricks for various age groups, 
and even had the teenagers gathered around a display of martial arts, for Bart Cart had turned up fresh from his morning's judo in Scarborough. She had sent off for a second for a record player and some records, knowing that oriental wrestling was not the kind of wrestling uppermost in the mind of the girls, at any rate. The adults had been shepherded around the grandstand and had been joined by the Walkworth Council and many notables from the village, all such as were not busy in their stores or doing business as middlemen to ferry candy and pop to the visitors. Here the loud hailer had been set up on a post as a makeshift, makeshift PA system, and the mayor had just introduced the minister, the Honorable David Williams. Williams was a short man, rather thick-set. Many people thought he was overweight, but this was an impression given by his square face. He was in his early forties and showing little sign of graying or balding. He spoke in a flat way, with little intonation or expression, a manner of speech that seemed a combination of the unflappability of the Western Ontario farmer, who knows that he has plentiful good land, and the dry tones of the four hundred of London, Ontario, who are afraid to sound emotional lest they sound like the other 156,000 of their city. Thank you for your kind words of introduction, Mr. Mayor. I'm greatly impressed with the community from everything I have seen and heard about it before coming here, and now from what I have seen on this my first way of visit. Work was already known long ago among discerning eaters of Ontario cheese, another level of government had made Walkworth better known for a less tasteful reason with the establishment of the penal institution. But we have to have such places, and the happy example of the present community of Walkworth will inspire those who have to stay there to better lives, as no doubt the environment makes the prison officials who live in Walkworth pleasant to work under. Hmm. Truman McCoy leaned over to Garth Ketting and said in a stage whisper, them ones inside are never the ones that will need to be. Garth shifted uncomfortably. Today, in Walkworth, we have assembled together by a happy chance two great elements of our Ontario society, the rural people who are the backbone of our life and the source of our daily bread. Backbone of the Conservative Party and source of your dough, murmured Hans Eklund's. And visitors from our great metropolitan area of Toronto, where industry and commerce have created communities of unparalleled beauty, cleanliness, and creativity. I would like all of you from both these elements of our society to know that your government in Ontario has the interests of both elements at heart and will continue to balance the needs of both for planning and legislation. We believe that our government has, over more than 30 uh, years, uh, re re richly deserved the confidence repeatedly placed in you in us. Uh, by Fidelim or Nortalas, Hans' words were just audible, by the people of Ontario. When I first was invited to address the visitors to the Own Your Own Ontario Development Corporation, I did not know that I would have to bear some disquieting news to you, though I am sure, Mr. Bondworthy, that your visitors today will want to invest in such lovely countryside. I have received news just this morning from the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice? that the titles you have given to these purchasing, pre purchase, those purchasing previous to now cannot be regarded as, as legal. Ah, there were gasps from Bonverley, Catting, and several others. But the majority were not affected either because they had come along for the ride or because the minister had effectively stopped them thinking in the first four sentences. Before anyone gets alarmed or before there is unwarranted confusion, Tedeschi was on the edge of the crowd, having done his weekly shopping in Wilkworth and hoping to stay on for the Donnybrook. Confusion, he thought. What does that remind me of? I want you all to know that after talking with Mr. Hagerman this morning, <clears throat> I've decided to ask the Prime Minister and the Cabinet for special legislation that will permit municipalities to pass suitable bylaws that will legitimize their such de title deeds. <clears throat> there should not be any embarrassment to any of our friends who have invested time and trouble in this enterprise. I am told that the local organizers have arranged for an annual Donnybrook's auction 
to take place a little earlier than usual today so that the visitors will be well occupied and the local good people can get to know you better. We know them quite well enough, thank you, Cynthia said, looks louder than her father, but loud enough to be heard. So such developments are really in the best interests of both the urban and rural sections of the population. I trust that when the appropriate moment comes, Mr. Mayor, you and your council will not refuse. Fuse, shouted Tradesky. Thy fuse, Mr. Bondworthy, my fuse, is lit since yesterday. He rushed up to the platform and dragged Bondworthy to him. It will go off on any time, and there will be no sign to keep the people away. Tradesky was shrieking, pushing his way through the crowd with a breathless Bondworthy. Good heaven, said the Minister of Municipal Affairs, his voice continuing to boom over the loud hailer along with less printable remarks from people around him, annoyed at the interruption. Oh, cried the mayor, the girls, my brother's children. With the words children becoming booming across the fairground, another and larger sound was heard, a great explosion from beyond town and the bypass from the site of the Triple O Lee Lodge. This is the end of our reading of chapter 17.